Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A lot of my pastoral brothers sometimes get attacked for being too impractical. They're accused of, of preaching things that don't seem to matter all that much. They, they're called sometimes too abstract, too much life after death stuff. They're too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good, I've heard it. And sometimes it's fair, especially in Lutheran circles, because we spend a lot of time on doctrine, a lot of sermons on doctrine, and it's important. And it is important because we feel that that is actually what you need. You need sound doctrine. You need rigorous teaching. You need relevant instruction so that your thinking will be right so that you can control your emotions, so that you can have appropriate behavior. We must come to grips with the idea that our earthly life is temporary. We are all on the clock. We do not know when our time on earth will come up. And everyone is looking for something to fill the holes in life because there's plenty of holes in our life. We have loneliness, insecurities, loss, fear. These are all common needs to all of us. I know you may feel like it might just be you. It's not. It's all of us. In this room, there are children afraid of the future. That are widows and widowers who grieve the loss of spouses. Wives who feel unappreciated, husbands who feel ignored, parents who have failed their children. And some of us carry these loads throughout all of our lives. Throughout all our lives, we, we carry these loads of grief and shame and guilt and regret. Some of us appear to have everything. And yet we know it's not true. Sometimes we feel like we could die. Sometimes we feel like we just as soon give up. For some of us, it's depression. For others, it's anxiety. Still others, it's stress. Could be something that I didn't even know to mention. But we all have holes. and We all look for cures. The problem is in order to fill those holes, we need something real. We need something tangible. The problem is we end up, as humans, flawed and broken as we are, we end up trying to fill those holes with things that are actually not real. We humans seek all kinds of diversions within our lives. For me, sometimes it's entertainment. I love to be entertained. It's great. I, right now I'm into movies, which is really weird. I've seen more movies in the last six months than I saw in the last three years. I don't know what happened. Something clicked and I went, let's go back to the movies. Technology is a good one. Technology is one that people like to use a lot. I myself am trying to get rid of some of my technology. I used to look at my phone. It's a true story. I used to look at my phone when I needed my phone. Now I look at it for no reason. I'll just pick it up to look at it to go, what's going on in the world? As if that is the world, right? Sometimes when I'm working in my office and I'm actually trying to work and I'm, I have to take the phone and I'll put it on the other side of the room, sometimes that doesn't work. I'll have to take it out to the car. I have to put it in the car so that I won't just pick it up and look at it. Not when it rings, not when it beeps, not when it does something, but just simply because I'm doing something, I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. Huh. I, I can tell I'm not the only one. I bought a new video game. I can't wait. Called Baldur's Gate 3. And my son actually bought it, downloaded it, put it onto his gaming computer, which he leaves at the house. And later on this afternoon, when he goes back to college, I get his room and his gaming computer with a brand new video game. I am so excited. People use all kinds of different things to fill holes. 
Some people use achievement. Not something I've ever had a problem with, by the way. For other people, it's money. For other people, it, it, it's false spiritualities, sex, drugs, rock and roll, alcohol, the glory of men. Or maybe just men, I don't know. I'm, I've never had that problem either. But we all have things that we use to divert our attention and fill the gaps of our lives. I think this massive proliferation of what I would call deviant sexual identities is not a symptom is of this same problem, the gay, trans, bi, trans, furries, bi plus, all of this, this phenomenon is a symptom of a deeper mental, spiritual, and emotional void exacerbated by nihilism that we've reached from the 20th century. God is dead, and we killed him. So we do everything that we can to fill those holes, to ease our loneliness, to answer our questions, to relieve our pain, and none of it works. And we know it doesn't work. It's not going to work. For the moment, it might seem to. I mean, it can divert us from what we are doing. I mean, like I said, I am so excited for tomorrow when the boy is gone to college and I have my day off and my brand new video game. I may spend all day in that room. But I know full well it's just a diversion. The issues and problems of my life, my real life, will still be there when I shut that computer off at 3 o'clock in the morning and go to bed. I know that. It's not a real remedy. And eventually, I'll get done with that game. It'll vanish like smoke. And again, those holes are, will need something real. Something real that can't be found in our elected officials. It can't be found in football. Certainly not any of my football teams. Can't be found in social media or in a concert or popularity. Not all the self-help books on all of Amazon are going to fill those holes. Real things, real holes, need real flesh and blood. They need real bread and wine. They need real word and water and dirt and life and death. We need truths, not half-truths. Not relativistic truth, not subjective truth. We need real truth. To hear real truth, to listen to the real word of God, to listen to the word of your creator. You see, your Savior knew that you were going to need something to hold on to. The days are tough. They're broken. They're dark. They're lonely. The world around us seems to be spinning out of control. People are doing some of the dumbest things that you can even think of, and you look at them and go, what in the world is going on? And then you realize they do not have the Spirit of God residing within them, and they are literally spinning out of control. It's like watching train wrecks and car wrecks throughout all of our lives, and you just stand there and go, there's nothing we can do about it. God knows that we're going to need something to sustain our faith because the world is just going to kick the stuffings out of you. Satan and his demons are not down in hell partying and, and abandoning the world and just ignoring us. They're not on holiday. They hate us. They're roaming about the planet looking for souls to destroy and to devour, and they're looking for you. And you have been afflicted before, and you will be afflicted again to comfort for your weary soul, to bring strength unto your faith, the Lord has given you real things to hang on to. Witness our New Testament lesson today. This is what Paul tells us. This is what Paul tells the Romans. Do you not know that you've been baptized into Christ Jesus and you were baptized into his death? You were buried, therefore, by him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, that we too might walk in a newness of life. Here, the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest preachers known to man, one of the best missionaries Christianity has ever seen, gives this incredible good news to the Romans. 
Something that they can hold on to. He tells them to hold on to the fact that they have been connected to Jesus Christ via your baptism. That that water actually did something. That it's made a real connection. He proclaims this real event with something that really happened to you. Paul is communicating here, not just to the Romans, but he speaks unto you and me every day. Your baptism. In your baptism, your old self died, and then somebody else, a new person, rose out of that water. That new person was reborn of water in the Spirit, and that really happened. Your old self is dead. It's gone. And your new identity, your new identity is is connected unto Christ Jesus himself. A real physical water combined with God's real word that has changed your entire future and you have been connected to it through baptism. And you died. You died. You were dead in your trespasses. And then you rose again from the dead. You have been resurrected. Now everything is different. So when you feel uncertain about your identity when you're confused about your value, when you don't know where to put your hope, and you don't know to, to, to look at from moment to moment, you must understand that you have been joined with water in the word to Jesus Christ himself and everything about you changed. That's where your identity is. The only identity you never, ever, ever need to worry about. It's hard to live in a fallen world. But the reality of our baptism gives us forgiveness, identity, salvation, and hope. Again, this is how Paul puts it. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to Christ Jesus. Here Paul connects these two historical events Christ's death and resurrection, he connects those two real events to your baptism. You have been connected through that baptism and Jesus' flesh and blood were nailed with real nails and nailed into real wood. And when Jesus hung on that real cross and experienced that real death, he actually really paid for all of your sins. From a real hell, he has rescued you. And he rose again to live an eternal life in heaven. And because you were forever connected by your baptism into this resurrection, that you too will live eternal life. This is what Paul urges the Romans to cling to. Dear Christian friends, God knows that the times are tough and that you need something to hold on to. This is why God connected heavenly things to earthly things. This is why worship is means to to fill your senses. When you come to the divine service, you're not alone. This room is filled with with other children of God, just as broken, just as baptized, just as beloved. And when we confess our sins, we see that we are not alone in our sins. We see the things of baptism and we see the things of worship that you don't see anyplace else. You don't see altars anyplace else. You don't see baptismal fonts. People don't stand in pulpits anyplace else. This is the only place that God has provided for these things, but he's provided them here for you. This means that this is the place where God is bringing you salvation. And he brings you here to hear that salvation. When you confess your sins, I announce the grace of God given unto you. It's no different than the forgiveness that you would receive if you were to ask for God's forgiveness when you were at home sitting at your dining room table reading your Bible on your your own. It is that same forgiveness that God has given to you, but he calls you here on a Sunday morning, and he calls you here so that you can hear it. Hear it. Listen to the very God, the voice of God that tells you your sins have been forgiven. And you know they've been forgiven because Jesus died to forgive them and he connected that forgiveness to your baptism. And then he calls you here so that you can hear it. The words of the sermon and the liturgy we speak together, 
You hear that you are a sinner, but also that you have been saved by God's grace, by the riches of the mercy of God. Long ago, churches used to have smells. Good smells, by the way, not bad smells. A lot of churches still do. It wasn't the Roman Catholics or the Eastern Orthodox that that originated the use of incense in worship. It started all the way back in the Old Testament with God telling the Old Testament people to burn incense when you do your worships. The burning of incense in the tabernacle was commanded by God. It was seen as it burned. It was seen as the smoke rose through the temple, the prayers of God's people rising up into heaven to be, to be sniffed by God, which in Hebrew it's a little weird, but God would literally smells it. He smells our prayers. And so to connect God's smelling of our prayers, he told them to burn incense. So literally the church used to smell differently than the rest of the world. You'd walk into a church and it would smell different. You'd go, smells like church. God joins his body and blood, his real body and blood, to earthly elements of bread and wine, and he gives us his real presence for the forgiveness of our sins, a forgiveness of sins that we can see, feel, taste, and touch. So we can hang on to it. Something tangible. Here we see God working, we hear his voice, we smell his prayers, eating and drinking of his presence. It seems that God has given us a lot of very real ways to hang on to his very real word. And in this way, Christ fills the holes in our lives that we could not help hope to have filled. It's Christ alone who makes us complete. Even so, Christian life is not perfect. It's not always easy either. We'll have times of loneliness and fear, and we'll suffer. We are. We will suffer. We're going to suffer because of our own sins that we have inflicted upon ourselves with the poor decisions that we have made. We're going to suffer because of other people's sins that they have inflicted upon us, which we in no way deserved, they'll still be there. And suffering's just as real, whether it's your fault or not. But the Christian life is also a life of assurance and hope. As you return to the world this morning, remember your baptism. It is real water joined to God's real word. And it has really washed away your guilt. It has pardoned you of your regret. This This washing has removed your shame. Look unto your baptism every day and you will find your identity. Start your name, your day, in the name of God and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in remembrance of that baptism and remember all the real things that God has done to connect you to him. He will be there supporting you day in and day out. And you'll find connection there. Connection with the people of God, connection to your history, connection to your forefathers. You will find connection to life and salvation and forgiveness. Look to your baptism. You'll find the reality of Christ. There's something that you can hang on to. And amidst the trials of the day, which are many. In Jesus' name, amen.